Good evening, everybody. Uh, find a seat and feel free to go to the cafe to get yourself something to eat, something to drink. We're going to take about 10 minutes before we start just so that you can get something to eat and find a comfortable seat for yourself. Ja sama suomeksi tervetuloa. Uh, aloitellaan ohjelma tuossa noin 10 minuutin päästä. Voit etsiä itsellesi istumapaikan ja hakee jotain syötävää ja juotavaa tuolta kahvion puolelta. Ja sitten kun kaikki on mukavasti istumassa, niin sitten vasta jatketaan. Tän illan ohjelma on englanniksi tästä eteenpäin, mutta nyt tämä alkuinfo myös suomeksi. Eli kohta puoliin aloitellaan.
We are about to start soon, so we're just get, giving a few minutes for people to get their cakes and sit down, and then we will continue. So I hope you're sitting comfortably and you have some something nice to eat and drink in front of you. Uh, don't worry, you can get more of that later. Um, but for now, I wanted to welcome you actually today to our spring villa worship. But as I was <laughs> coming here, I thought maybe it's more of a winter villa worship still, because there's quite a lot of snow still. But regardless, you're warmly welcome to this worship night. Um, a week ago... Uh, the whole Christian world was celebrating Easter, one of the biggest Christian um, celebrations. And tonight we are still a little bit around the same topic uh, at the cross, wondering about that great deed of love that was done at Calvary. Now, I don't know how you feel, but um, I tend to grow tired of this fast-paced world. You know, of all the achieving and of all the, all the climbing higher and making money and, and gaining status and that kind of a eternal wheel that never ends. And I find that quite tiring. And the great thing about the cross is that when you're at the foot of it and you're looking at Jesus, all of the other things, they kind of lose meaning. They become insignificant. They, they don't matter anymore. What's wealth or riches compared to eternal salvation? Nothing. granted 
Jesus speaking about this uh, spiritual reality here on this earth that you can you can be alive but at the same time you can be dead and uh, he was talking about those people and he he met with those people who were at the same time walking there um, breathing but Jesus called them dead uh, why we can be so um, um, lost uh, and, and in our sin, we can uh, carry this burden, this shame, and not notice our true spiritual uh, state. And Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is offering us. I remember um, after my baptism, I was feeling... Um, such a weight just lifted off of my shoulders. I don't know if any of you still remember um, how you felt after your baptism. I, maybe there are some people who haven't experienced anything um, like, a, like this um, feeling of, of, of being called and being uh, washed by... Um, by the sacrifice of Christ and now Jesus is still calling Jesus is still calling um, your name and if you have lost your way somehow um, in, in, in Christianity or you are feeling like you're stumbling in the darkness Jesus is still calling your name he wants you um, to answer if you are in a place where you haven't yet experienced this gift of salvation, Jesus is calling your name. And uh, as Lazarus uh, jumped up out of the grave and answered the call, he, Jesus wants us to experience the same, uh, the same as we are, uh, as we are joined with Him. And and this is a song now that we are going to sing. About, uh, about this glorious day where we all are invited to be united with our Savior. If you know this song, uh, please sing it. And uh, if you don't, uh, may it be a prayer for you as well. 
for you. It's from Isaiah chapter 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. There's no greater love than that. It's the greatest love story that I know.
Good evening, everyone. I'll read you one of my poems that tells about mercy. The original poem is in Finnish, but now it's translated in English. My treasure. A white snow blanket covers the black ground, curtains the dirt into a twinkling veil, just as our mistakes, crimson red, redeemed by Jesus. Your sins have been forgiven. Let me remember that my greatest gift is to be loved by you. 
let me feel your mercy as my treasure that cleanses me to be as pure as snow. The snowflakes fall down from the sky. Every single one of them is different, just as the unique opportunities given by God. Is this a time for a new beginning? Let me shine your brightness into this world of night. Let me bring with my life glory to you with everything I am to be a blessing to others. Go in peace. I'll work in you. A week ago, we got to celebrate Easter and remember Jesus' death and resurrection. Facing what happened at the cross makes one think about the mercy of Jesus. His mercy is so much more than we can ever understand. Now you can take part in a practice that demonstrates mercy. You have uh, red papers on your tables. There should be several. So everyone, you can take a, a red paper and confess your sins basically anything that takes you away from Jesus by writing or drawing it somehow by some symbols for example um, God knows it anyway and don't worry no one else will read it it's just for you and after you you've written or drawn what you want to confess somehow bring the paper there here at the altar Maybe you can make some room there that people can walk past. Um, there's a beautiful picture of Jesus and a cross painted by Arya Vallanvara, the previous art teacher of Toivonlinna. Uh, there you can throw or leave the paper into the red rubbish bin and put it uh, under the red uh, fabric. That, this symbolizes how Jesus' blood covered your sins because he died for you. When you've left your red sin papers at the altar, you can take a new white paper from next to the altar. There. That describes the new life that Jesus gives you because he was raised from death. And when you've taken the white paper, you can go back to your place and write or draw what you want to change in your life. You can ask God, what should you do? How would you like to change? What do you want to do better? It's also just for yourself. Hopefully this practice helps us to remember that our greatest treasure is the mercy of Jesus. Because of his mercy, our sins are forgiven we can leave them to Jesus. Because of his mercy, we can start again. We rise to life with Jesus. Hopefully that makes us share the good we've got. Want to bring glory to God and shine his light to others. So now you can take time to confess your sins on red papers, bring them to the altar and take the new white papers and Decide how do you want to start again?
You've done before in the You'll do again. Cause there's no prison hall you can't break through. No mountain you can't move. All things are possible. There's no
Okay. Shh. We are continuing. We are continuing with our program. If you can find your seats again. Yes. I want to invite you all um, to close this beautiful activity uh, with prayer. And we will continue our program with a uh, few more uh, songs. Let's, uh, let's quiet down for a prayer. Almighty Father in heaven, we are grateful. We want to thank you today for, for bringing us here, for reminding us that Jesus paid it all for reminding us that when you look at us, you don't see the work, the works that we, we have done, the, the sin that we have uh, been stained with. You don't see our shame. You don't see our shortcomings. You don't look at us with con condemnation because of Jesus. We are washed. We are pure. And because of Jesus, we can stand in front of you, Lord. We are thankful and we want to praise you. We want to uh, praise your son for the freedom and for the, this white sheet that we can have now, the white robe that we can wear. May you be glorified forever in our hearts. Amen. Amen. All I have because of Jesus All this promise one for me when he paid the highest ransom once for all always for my freedom I will boast in Christ righteousness and not my own I will cling to Christ my hope His mercy reigns now and forever love will never lose its power all my failures not a race now I walk within your favor grace and ending my salvation I will boast in Christ alone his righteousness
His righteousness and not my own. I will cling to Christ my hope. His mercy reigns now and forever. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that. What's the first word that comes to your mind when you think about Jesus? Um, how would you describe him? The truth is that our words lack meaning when we try to describe God. It's like, it's like our language just isn't enough, you know what I mean? Because there's really nothing like him, uh, nothing that compares to him. What could we, how could we describe him with our human language and words? Only some expressions from the Bible, I think, uh, can come close to describing him. And I think it's, it's th those parts in the Bible that describe his sacrifice, the salvation plan, the story of redemption. There's nothing like it. Jesus is above everything else. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. <laughs> What? 
Amen. Thank you to the band. Praise be to God. Um, today, the topic of today is His mercy is more. Uh, that's what we were at least told on the brochures and that's what we've come here to celebrate. God's mercy is more. And I'm going to hope to steer this not just into being sort of food for thought, but hopefully something that's at least going to spark some practical change in your life. Um, Mike is going to cut me off in 10 minutes, so I'm going to just dive right in. There's going to be three points. His mercy is more. So, mercy from what? Um, secondly, how is mercy more? And then thirdly, how will you respond to his mercy. So first, mercy from what? You can shout it out. <laughs> I mean, it's not a trick question. Sin. <laughs> but what is sin? What is sin? I'm going to start with um, an analogy. Now, those of you who know me well enough, um, you know that I can be quite clumsy. If there was someone, as a kid... If there was someone at a kid's party who would spill their juice all over the table, that was me. Uh, in high school, I was once absentmindedly drinking tea, having a conversation with someone in the cafeteria, and uh, I just forgot to put the mug to my mouth and poured the whole thing in my lap. <laughs> now, after high school, I was even awarded um, first prize in clumsiness by my brother, because I managed to chop off a couple of fingers with a table saw. Last year, my, my wife, uh, she fell and fractured a vertebra in her, bra in her back. And um, she was still recovering and, you know, having to avoid quick movements and so on. And I was carrying a mattress past her, and I happened to knock the mattress into the chair that she was sitting in, and it jerked her neck, and, you know, she was still in pain after the freshly... Uh, occurred injury. Um, so, you know, I could give you way more examples, but I think you get the point. Um, now, my clumsiness has amounted to not just being a nuisance and annoying at times, but it has always, oh, has always, but, well, probably, but it has also been harmful to myself and harmful to others. Now, I, I admit that this analogy to sin here is a bit weak. You know, sin is far greater and evil and far more destructive than mere clumsiness. Um, but it's something none of us here today chose to become sinful, that is. None of us chose to become sinful. The reality is that for us, it's impossible not to sin. In fact, the problem lies in us being descendants of Adam and Eve. When the first humans, when they believed the serpent and distrusted God, they essentially disconnected from their life support system in God, 
and they plug themselves into the botnet run by Satan. And now we're all stuck there. And now because if we are under the rule of Satan, by virtue of the fact that you know, we are descendants of Adam and Eve, it's impossible, impossible for us to do what's right. Ultimately, um, sin is relational corruption. It destroys all relationships, and it's self-destructive as well. You know, I have said many nasty things in my life, but I've also been the recipient of hurtful words and actions. Um, we've all experienced sin, and we continue to experience it. So, I don't know, you could say that we are all experienced sinners. Um, personally, it's not that I like it this way. Actually, I hate it, and I wish things were different. The older I get, the more aware I've become of the seriousness of sin in my life how sometimes seemingly insignificant things snowball into this avalanche of destruction and chaos. I don't know, perhaps, perhaps you can relate, maybe not. Now, wrong actions themselves, they are a consequence of sin. They're not the root of it. And so, the realization that we are powerless in our own selves, to change our condition, that's the first step towards receiving the mercy and grace of God. You know, I can relate to Paul when he says that I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. That's in Romans 7. Later in the same chapter, he says, it's almost like a rhetorical question, who will rescue me from this body of death? And then he's Continuing from that, he says, Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that gets us to how is his mercy more? Um, a quick definition first. What is mercy? Because sometimes I think we interchange mercy and grace very freely. Uh, mercy is when you do not receive what you, deserve, what you deserve. And grace is when you receive something that you do not deserve. So, God's mercy, it's not just withheld punishment. Because in that case, you know, he could have said, okay, you don't deserve the punishment that you receive and left it there. It actively helps us who are in this miserable state that we are in due to circumstances that are beyond our control and he brings in God's mercy which is most evident in him sending Jesus for our salvation. Okay, how so? Now, when, when John, the revelator and the writer of the Gospel of John when he sat down to write his gospel, many others had already written, written uh, accounts of Jesus before that. But he starts from the beginning. John 1.1, 1, 1, it's almost like reading Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word, Jesus, was with God, and the Word was God. And then further on in verse 14, he says this, And the Word became flesh and lived among us. Now, we're so familiar with that concept that we kind of shrug it off as if it's a given. Now, of course, yeah, Jesus was here. He became flesh. Everyone knows. But think of this. Jesus didn't just momentarily stoop down into humanity as if putting on a suit for an evening and then taking the filthy thing to the dry cleaners the next day. No, he, he actually altered himself for eternity. He made himself, it says in the, in the Bible, for a little while lower than the angels. So God, he not only came to save us, but God 
gave himself to us through Jesus. That's the crucial thing. He gave us, he gave himself to us, not just for us. I don't know if you, you know, you feel special because of that already. But I think it's just amazing if we, if we stop and think of it. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, he explained our situation like this. He says, only a bad person needs to repent. Only a good person can repent perfectly. The worse you are, the more you need it and the less you can do it. The only person who could do it perfectly would be a perfect person and he wouldn't need it. But suppose God became a man. He could surrender his will and suffer and die because he was a man. And he could do it perfectly because he was God. Now here's an interesting thought along the same lines. Uh, originally, it was Satan's purpose to eternally separate humanity from God, just like himself. But God, in his mercy, he looked on humanity in its helpless state and brokenness and executed plan B for us. And he executed that plan through Jesus. And because of that, humanity is now more closely united to God than if we had not sinned. So God fixed the situation in a way which is we're kind of better off now than we were in the beginning. It's like amazing grace, mercy, like how would you call it? Um, you know, Paul, I think, is a prime example. He's a personification of mercy applied and grace received. You know, by his own words, he was seething with hate towards the Christians, and he was a feared murderer of Christians. Uh, he says in Galatians that he was violently persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. But Paul's also a great example of how religion without Christ is counter-religious. He knew the scriptures, again by his own reckoning, uh, better than almost anyone in his peer group. Yet they were absolutely useless to him without Christ. Just think about God's, uh, how God's mercy and his grace acted out in Paul's life in the end. Think of the huge influence that Paul has had on Christianity. You see, before Paul met Jesus, Saul, he was zealous for God, but unknowingly he sought to kill God's people. Now, God saw that and Maybe he saw something in Paul that was, you know, he was so full of this zeal. Um, God saw that and in his mercy, he equipped Saul to become Paul in order to realize his full potential in Christ. In other words, there wouldn't have been a Paul without God's mercy and grace. There would only have been a Saul the guy who held the jackets of those who stood and martyred or killed the first martyr, Stephen. And then he was just a guy who once persecuted the church. That would have been the end of the story. There wouldn't have been a Paul. There would only have been a Saul. And that brings us to how will you respond to his mercy? I mean, yeah, Paul, he was called by God for a tremendous purpose. But he could have said no. And God sees the full potential in you. So what's stopping you from tapping into that potential and living out God's mercy and grace in your life? If we think that, you know, we're not all that bad, the idea of uh, the mercy and grace that God freely gives us, it's not going to change us. Then again, if we're seeking to be saved by the obedience of the law, we're going to be constantly trying uh, to limit the scope and the application of the law in order to make it more manageable for us to keep. 
the gospel is like uh, a pair of glasses through which we can look back, reflect on our lives, and see God preparing us and shaping us, even through our own failures and sins, to become a channel for His grace so that that can flow into the world around us. And I, I, I think we should form some kind of club, uh, Cineholics Anonymous or something. I don't, perhaps we actually already have that. It's called the church. Um, you know, we're not here to pretend to be holier than each other. We're not here to smirk at each other's sins. Oh, wow, you do that. No, it's more like, oh, you do that. I'm going to help you. I've been there as well. So, to be a Christian, it's more than simply having an intellectual a belief in Christ. You have to have a personal relationship. As Christians, we, we've got this responsibility to, re, to reveal Christ through what we do, what we say, and who we are. God's mercy can equip you today to your full potential if you choose to allow him. So I'd say, like Paul, we really need a personal encounter with Christ. Not just so that we can understand our need for his mercy and his grace and that we can be saved, but more importantly, when Christ is revealed to us and when we fully understand the magnitude of his mercy and his grace, only then can he be revealed through us. And that's when his mercy becomes more and more. Now, discussion. Mike's going to put up some question points on the screen. He said three questions, so um, uh, I snuck in two into the first one because I couldn't fit them all. <laughs> What's preventing you from reaching your full potential in Christ? And I kind of carry on from that. How do you see that God has equipped you to take part in sharing his mercy to others? You know, this doesn't only have to be personal. You know, it, you, can, you can think about it. Um, but you can also discuss, I don't know, phenomena, habits, or things in our society that are preventing us even collectively from a, uh, a full surrender to God. How could we nurture a community where, for example, prayer is central to all our actions? Okay, the second one. What's the difference between being moral and being a Christian? An atheist has also a moral compass, and they might treat others at an even higher moral standard than some professed Christians do. So what is the difference? Um, three, do you see and experience God's mercy playing out in your church community? If you do, you can share your testimony. Uh, if you don't, how can you contribute? <laughs> how can you make a change? So, food for thought, hopefully something practical as well to help you along. Um, thank you and be blessed. Thank, thanks uh, to God. Maybe we can just say a prayer at the end here. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we ask you that you would show us your mercy and your grace in a brighter way tonight. Help us to fully understand, increasingly understand what you have done for us, what we need to be saved from, our own weakness, and our only hope in you. Thank you for becoming flesh and giving us the potential to be more than we are. Amen.
what love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, He counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. would wait as we constantly roam what father so tender is calling us home he welcomes the weak as the vilest the poor our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the Lord of kindness he lavished on us his blood was the payment his life was the cause we stood at the death we could never afford our sins they are many but his mercy is more praise the And so we transition to our last song of the evening. Yes, we hope this evening was a blessing to you all. And uh, with this last song, may we want to invite you all to rise up. Uh, and, and, and join. Uh, if it's a new song, please um, still uh, try to sing it along, learn it. It's a beautiful song. Um, if you know it, we expect uh, that you would also sing strongly and praise our Lord and Savior. <laughs> Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I'll praise when I feel it and praise when I don't. I'll praise cause I know you're 
still in control. My praise is a weapon, it's more than a sound. My praise is a shout that brings Jericho down. Come on. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Praise Praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true, praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign, praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you Praise the Lord, oh my soul Praise the Lord, oh my soul Praise the Lord, oh my soul Praise alive how could i keep it inside no i won't be quiet my god is alive how could i keep it inside i won't be quiet my god is alive how could i keep it inside come on praise the lord oh my soul Father, we want to praise you with all our hearts, Lord, for what you have done for us, for closing this gap that sin has made between you and us. Thank you for sending your son. Thank you for his sacrifice. Thank you for your mercy and the abundance, Lord, that we can have when we come before you, Lord, we can come knowing that you are Father who welcomes the lost son, who welcomes the sinner, who loves and surrounds with his mercy and grace, Lord. We can trust in your power to transform us, to lead us in, from darkness into your wonderful, wonderful light. As we have, Lord, gathered here and as we have been blessed with your wisdom, Lord, as we have heard your, your word, Lord, we pray that the seeds that have been planted in our hearts would grow and grow and would bring fruit for your kingdom, Lord. Lord, that this mercy, we would not take it as something cheap, Lord, but we would remember daily the heavy price that Jesus has paid the mercy that we can have it's not a license for us to sin without ceasing but lord it is something that we can fall on when we just miss the target help us to lord always seek for your guidance for your um, salvation lord in every way lord we surrender ourselves into your loving hands and may you um, continue guiding us on this journey home thank you jesus in your name we pray amen, amen. so we have come to the 
end of our program tonight, but it's not the end of the evening. Please stay, enjoy, have something to eat and drink. The questions from Glenn are going to be on the screens. Maybe that's something that you can discuss with the people at your table. Um, enjoy. Um, and for the future, I just want to point out that our next Villa Worship evening is going to be on the 21st of September. So mark that already in your calendars. Please be there. Um, we'll be happy to see you again then. Um, yeah, so that's it. Be blessed. <laughs>